Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I am so glad to be here in Liverpool, which is a city which has so many connections with my own homeland of Ireland. As Herb says, I'm here to talk to you about autonomous weapons. And he completely stole the thunder of my first slide because this is not what we're worried about. This, it just people, people hear the words autonomous weapons and killer robots, and they immediately picture this. But actually, this is not science fiction. This is not um, you know, the singularity. This is not a worry that the robots are going to rise up and take over. We're actually worried that the robots are terrible and stupid and will kill people by accident and will cause all sorts of political problems. So that's what this talk is about. So just to underline that this is actually a, a serious point and not really just a bunch of crackpots, um, this is Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, and he's saying here that killer robots are um, morally repugnant and shall be prohibited by international law. And he's also telling us what an autonomous uh, killer robot is. It just means something that has the power and discretion to select its own target. So we're not talking something that should be sentient or able to carry on a sensible conversation with you or understand anything. We're just talking about a machine that is programmed to decide when it gets to take a shot. And that is a much, much lower bar. And that's something that is a technological reality today. So we've sort of, you know, like Herb was saying in the introduction, you know, we, we need to start thinking about the impact of technology in our society more because we've gotten to the point where our technological innovation has overshot our, um, you know, our, our ability to make law around it. So what is the algorithmic, algorithmic warfare cross-functional team? Um, I always show this logo when I, when I talk about this topic because it's just so funny. So this is a DOD, um, US DOD, Department of Defense project, which basically um, aims to try and get private sector technological expertise into the military fast. Um, the, the little Latin slogan here says, we are here to help. And uh, either the person who, who designed this logo has zero sense of irony or a huge sense of irony because I, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, right? So it's not happy, happy, fun, helpful, Heart, ro robot heart, fun things at all, right? This is a, it's, 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 it's kill chain. This is work that is intended to use computers to help the military kill people faster if they need to. Um, what it's really about is it's about using private AI technology developed by companies such as Google and Clarify and Microsoft and taking it and using it to get insights from their drone um, their drone video faster. So they're, they're flying hundreds, thousands of drones over places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somalia, and they are, prior to MAVEN, they were using giant um, workforces of human beings to look at this data, to look at this video footage, pick out people and vehicles and other kind of points of interest and, and turn that into into information that they can work with. And the idea of Maven is to do that automatically using AI instead. So it doesn't sound like this is so bad. Um, it doesn't sound like this is something dangerous, but there's a lot of implications around this that, that worried us at Google. So this is what Jamie Zawinski, who is the founder of Mozilla Browser, the Mozilla, the Mozilla Foundation as well, this is what he's had to say about it. You know, we need to think about the link between this and killing because it's there, it's, it's not just the, the happy hearts and, and helpfulness thing. Some of the political implications that worried us were, if you have the political will to, to intensify your drone strike program, and you have, the, you have a system that gives you this sort of insight, uh, it becomes very easy to write rules that say things like, any group of more than six males in this territory, drone strike, any convoy of more than two vehicles, drone strike. It becomes very easy to sort of ramp up your level of violence at will, and that's, that's not a neutral kind of application of technology. We were also very worried that this is a major step towards the development of autonomous weapons systems. You know, this could be the eyes and, and most of the brain of an autonomous weapons system. So this is an existing autonomous weapons system. 
This is a thing called an IAI Harop. It's built by an Israeli company called IAI, and it is a loitering munition. So what this thing does is you launch it, and it patrols a particular territory, and it seeks out radar signals that it doesn't recognize from, from like an approved list that you give it. And if it sees one of those, it will kamikaze dive and blow it up. So this has been used in, 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 in battle in Azerbaijan. This is a Russian T-14 Armata tank. This has autonomous firing capability. It has an unmanned gun turret, and it has um, an autonomous functionality for firing back when it detects incoming fire. And they're, they're, they talk about working on adding all sorts of other autonomous functionality to it. Um, they have an objective they would like to get to, to a point of having a completely unmanned autonomous tank vehicle. This is the, the most worrying thing that we have seen in quite a long time. And this is a really recent development. This is a drone called the Cargo. So the Cargo drone, this is a very small drone. This is something like your domestic drone, maybe sort of yay big. And um, it's designed to carry about a kilo and a half of explosive payload. This thing has a huge amount of autonomous functionality. What it is, uh, one of the things it can do that we haven't seen before is it incorporates facial recognition technology. Um, now, they haven't said what this is for, but we can only assume that if you're, if you're looking at facial recognition technology in your drone, what you want to do with it is to use it to hunt down people, uh, maybe particular individuals, maybe, um, maybe even an entire ethnic group. Um, this is not, not without the bounds of possibility. It's just a dreadfully worrying kind of scenario. And Turkey are talking about deploying this into Syria. So that's worrying. Um, the other thing as well to know about uh, facial recognition, recognition technology is um, putting all of the ethical concerns around uh, you know, targeted execution by drone aside. It's not even very accurate. The, the best source for information about this is the United States National Institute for Standards and Technology. And every couple of years, they, they develop a report on accuracy of existing facial recognition uh, systems. And the most recent one says, quite bluntly, that they're not good enough yet to trust for anything that's important, that there needs to be uh, human beings involved in that decision as well. And I, 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 I very strongly suspect that when they, when they built that, they were talking about uh, much more innocuous applications than uh, deciding about the life or death of a person. So, political implications. Further automation of warfare, um, further, um, further distancing of war from human beings and human, human decision making. That's a, it's a worrying prospect politically. So one of the big kind of pressures against warfare is, is that you have to convince your people that it's worthwhile to go and fight this war for you. It's, it's part of keeping war politically honest. If we can just send out machines to do our dirty work, that sort of disengages us politically from warfare, and that's, um, that's really worrying. This is a quote from a former Marine called Anthony Swafford. He wrote the, the book Jarhead, which was quite critically acclaimed, and about three weeks ago, he had a really excellent article about remote warfare and why it's bad. There's questions about legal accountability. Uh, war is not a free-for-all. There is quite a complex system of um, of rules and uh, norms and customs around, uh, around armed combat, the laws of armed combat, international humanitarian law. Um, it's not a free for all. War crimes do exist. One of the great problems that we see with increasing autonomy in weapons is that it really distances um, anyone from responsibility. It creates this accountability gap. It, it will make it harder to, to sort of maintain justice in warfare. And that's, uh, that's a big problem. Now, onto some of the, the technical arguments. And I'm, I'm a software engineer, and I still work as a software engineer in addition to campaigning. And so this is my bread and butter, and this is what I've been doing for years and years and years. Um, I make technical arguments for a living. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have the, you know, probably in a, the length of an entire college seminar is how long it would take to go into all of these. but. I want to draw a comparison between something that's a little bit more familiar to people. So autonomous driving. 
John Krafsik is the CEO of Waymo, which is probably one of the biggest autonomous driving companies. It's the one that Google owns. And he was quoted as saying that autonomy will always have constraints and that it might not even be possible to get an autonomous car, a fully autonomous car, into production anytime within the foreseeable future. And this is a very big, uh, this is very different to what people were saying even five years ago. They were saying, oh, in 2020, we will all be you know, in autonomous taxis, and if you drive for a living, your job is imperiled. And this is just not what has come to pass, because autonomy is hard, right? Autonomy in self-driving cars has proved really hard. And self-driving cars are an easy problem compared to autonomous weapons. Your self-driving car problem goes like this. I want to get from A to B without crashing into anything. That's pretty clear, right? It is. Whereas your autonomous weapons problem is, I want to go out and I want to patrol an area and I want to maybe blow some stuff up, but only if it's legal according to the rules of international law. And only if doing so provides a, a military benefit that is proportional to the damage that's done and so on and so forth, right? That's a much harder problem. And it's a much harder problem to solve with technology because the bounds of it are just so much less clear. And as well, if you're building an autonomous car, you can, you can pretty much go out and test it on all, of the, on all the roads you want, right? Um, you know, subject to laws and subject to having somebody who is, um, who is who's monitoring the car and monitoring for, for its safe driving and able to take over. You can go out and you can test it. If you are building an um, autonomous military robot, you have to worry about where do I test it. You do not have war battlefield environments on tap in the same way that you have roads on tap. So you, you have this problem where you can't test it in real circumstances. The other problem, uh, on the roads, most people are trying to behave in a predictable manner according to the rules, which don't change. Um, the rules of the road are very much similar from one place to another with a few, you know, a few little tweaks here and there. Whereas battlefields, every battle is different. Technology changes. Um, people are going to be actively trying to subvert you and your technology. This is um, just so much of a harder problem. It's, it's, it's hard to even talk about all of the dimensions of why it's harder, right? So you have this conversation with military people. And I've had this conversation with members of the UK military and the US military and, and others. And they say things like, well, well, Laura, you're talking about this very, this very big problem where this machine is going to have all sorts of autonomy. You know, what, what if we restricted the autonomy of this machine down to just you know, targeting a, you know, a very defined target in a very small area? And my answer to that is, that exists already, and that's a precision-guided missile, and we're not trying to ban that. We're trying to ban things that are more like the cargo that's potentially going to be hunting out individual people. We're trying to ban things like the harpy, which, can, which goes after these uh, radar signals. You know, that, that, that's the kind of stuff we worry about, the things that are free in time and space to, to strike at will. So this is the United Kingdom's um, current policy on autonomous weapons. And um, I'll just take a couple of seconds and have a read of that. It's, it's, it's capable of understanding higher level intent and direction and deciding a course of action without depending on human oversight. So this, this language, it can be a little bit hard to parse, but what they're talking about here is actually a pretty high degree of intelligence. We're talking something that's much more like Terminator or Skynet. So the UK says it won't build this, but what it's saying when, the, when it says it won't build autonomous weapons is that it won't build Skynet, not that it won't build the Harpy. This is the, the Tyrannus drone. It's a UAV, which is the military like to call drones UAVs because it sounds more cool. It means un, unmanned aerial vehicle, but it's basically a big drone. And um, it has a fairly high degree of automated capability. It can navigate to an area, it can hunt out targets, and it can request permission from an operator to, to make a strike. So this is, this is something that is being built here in the UK. Um, it's, it's, it's experimental, but this is clearly the way that technology is going. Um, I work with a campaign to stop killer robots. Uh, we uh, campaign at the UN level, national levels, 
and we try and raise awareness about this issue and we agitate for a ban treaty against autonomous weapons. Next week, we're gonna be in Geneva. We have the annual meeting of the high contracting parties and that will set out what the work is going to be over the next couple of years towards a treaty. If you're interested in this issue, stopkillerrobots.org slash act, and there are a number of things that, that anyone can do. Talk to your political representatives um, if you care about this issue. Thank you so much for your time and attention.